good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this uh, Zoom talk by Oxford Civic Society. Um, I'm Clive Booth, president of the Civic Society. And if you're not an already a member, I do hope you'll join. It's easy to do so by Googling Oxford Civic Society and clicking on the Join Now button. The annual subscription is only £15 for an individual or £25 for joint membership and £5 for students. Just before introducing our speaker tonight, I'd just like to outline for those of you who may not have been uh, in any of these sessions before, um, how we propose to proceed. Um, the session will last for about an hour overall. It could overrun, it could underrun. Um, we are not um, pinned down to precise timing. Um, and there'll be an, audience, uh, an opportunity for the audience members to ask questions or make comments. Um, and subject to uh, reviewing copyright and other considerations, we hope to make a recording available on YouTube. Uh, our website lists all the past talks uh, that are accessible on YouTube. And it is just a question of making sure that um, what we are mounting up there is absolutely legal and uh, permissible in terms of the rules to do with uh, uh, copyright and so on. Um, during the talks, uh, during the talk, your, your microphone will be muted, but you can submit your questions or comments at any time using the chat facility, which depending on the type of device you're using, uh, will be either along the top line or the bottom line of your screen. At the end of the talk, uh, my colleague, Ian Salisbury, who chairs our program group, which is responsible for mounting the walks and talks, and he'll take over from me from the, for the question and answer session. So now to our topic for this evening, the Otmore RSPB Reserve. This is one of the jewels in the crown of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And we're very pleased indeed tonight to welcome David Wilding, who is the site manager at Op Opmore. Uh, David uh, graduated from Cranfield University with a degree in environmental science. Um, I should say environmental management, correction. Uh, his, career, his career has taken him to the US National Park Service, the New Forest, work as an urban park ranger, and for the last 17 years, a member of the Otmore team, where he is now the site manager. So that's more than enough from me. It's a great pleasure to welcome David this evening. David, over to you, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, I, I still can't quite get used to giving a talk from my spare room. Um, I kind of, it's nice to go into a room, it's nice to meet people, it's nice to stand up in front of people and get a reaction, you know, as I'm talking, but I'm kind of sat in my spare room at the moment and it doesn't quite feel like I'm talking to 70 plus people, so it does feel very weird. Um, I suppose the plus side of it, I did think about this earlier, and the plus side is I don't have to like get into Oxford to do the talk and I can be finished, you know, by nine o'clock and I can get home quite quickly as well. Um, so there are some plus sides, but um, but it is, it is very weird. It's still very weird doing a talk um, to, to a TV screen in my spare bedroom. But anyway, um, as Clive said, I'm going to be talking to you about Otmore. Um, now, I... I think I've probably got one of the best jobs in Oxfordshire, certainly in Oxfordshire and probably the surrounding area. If you're into wildlife, you know, I, I think I, I have one of the best jobs because um, I get to work on this fabulous site. Now, what I would normally do at this point is ask how many of you have been to Otmore and I'd ask for a show of hands, but I obviously can't do that tonight. So it's very, very difficult. Um, but I'm, I'm suspecting that a large majority of you probably have been to Otmore. Um, but if there is a minority that haven't been there, I'm hoping that after this evening's talk, you'll think, I didn't know that was on my doorstep, only a few miles from the centre of Oxford, and I think I might go and visit it. And, and if, that, if, if that's what you're, if, that, if I get that much out of the end of the talk, I think that'll be, that'll be really good and I'll be really pleased. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to start my timer as well. So I've got a rough idea of how long so I do talk a lot. Um, so, yeah, so that's the plan. So I'll be talking to you about the history of the reserve of the history of Otmore going back, you know, 
quite in the, in the distant past. Um, then I'll be talking about kind of the RSPB's involvement and the creation work that we've done, because, um, you know, we've, we've actually created a reserve or not more. It's not just been there and it's existed. We've, we've had to do a lot of work to create it. And then I'm going to take you through the seasons of the typical wildlife that we get on Otmore. I can't cover everything because there's so much to cover, um, but I'll, I'll just give you a bit of a taster of, of, the, of the wildlife that's around. Um, and then I'll finish up with some more of the, the success stories of Otmore as well, kind of some of the, 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 the real highlights of, of what we've achieved, okay? So it's gonna be a whistle-stop tour. We've got 45 minutes. There's a lot to cram in and, and a lot of stuff to talk about. So let's press on. So this is Otmore in the early 1800s. The red circle that goes around the edge here, this is what we call the 60 meter contour. And anything inside that we regard and we call the Otmore Basin. The whole area in size is probably about 1400 he hectares. Now, in the early 1800s, it was very much a kind of a, a wetland wilderness. Um, you've got the River Ray that drain, uh, flows in from the north and the Ray kind of drains a lot of Buckinghamshire and then it flows into Oxfordshire and kind of drains into the Otmore Basin. And then it exits out to the west and it eventually joins up with the Charwell and on, on to the Thames into Oxford and stuff like that. But where it exits, you've actually got high land. So the yellow land here is actually slightly higher and the land rises up either side. So it ends up as a, as a bit of a funnel. So as the water flows in, it kind of spreads out over this flat clay basin and it floods. So back in Back in the 1800s, the, the villagers from around the moor, um, they, they, they used to call them towns, the seven towns of Otmore, but they're, they're really villages. But the villagers used to have common in rights. So they would, um, they would put their animals down in the summer, they would put cattle out there, they would take geese down there, and they would graze in the summer months. And then in the winter, when it flooded, and it did flood, it just literally was just like a lake, a large lake. Um, they would go down and then just shoot the waterfowl and sell them in, in the Oxford marketplaces and cut firewood as well for the winter. Um, there's stories of them actually killing bittern and selling them in, in the Oxford marketplaces, which is, which is quite incredible, really. But I would love to be taken back in time to experience what Otmore was like then, because it's just, I just, I think it just would have been an incredible kind of wild area and, and, and totally different to, to what it is today even and, and to what it, how it's changed over the years. I'm going to take you forward in time now. This is only about the 1830s. And basically a chap called Alexander Croke decided that he was going to drain the moor um, and he was going to use the active enclosure and he was going to get the richer people around the moor to pay money towards the drainage so that um, so that basically he could he could put the drainage in and then that they would be able to farm it for longer into the season, you know, be able to maybe maybe grow crops or um, also to keep animals out there for longer because they would drain it. Now, this was incredibly unpopular with the local people, the local moor folk um, who have had these common in rights all their lives. And there was a very famous Otmore riots that went on where the locals kind of were up in arms. They, they had, there's a riot in Oxford. Um, and they also kind of every time they planted hedgerows or they, they put in um, ditches, they would fill them in or rip out the plants as well. So it's a very volatile period of the Otmore history. And it is very well written about um, the kind of the Otmore riots. But unfortunately, they weren't successful in stopping the active enclosure, which was the parceling up of the land. Um, and Alexander Croke did actually change some of the character of the moor. Um, and he basically redirected the river. So you've got the new river ray that runs around the top here. And this is a canalized river, you know, it looks like a canal, very wide, steep sides. It's still there today. You can still see it. And he also put in this ring ditch system. Um, we've got the outer and inner ring ditch. And the whole purpose of this was to get the water out as quickly as possible. Now, although he put all this effort into it and, and the land was parceled up into these smaller parcels, um, it actually wasn't that successful and Otmore still continued to flood. And, and the story goes, what I've read, is that he actually died a poor man as well. Um, so it, it's quite an incredible story, but that, that's kind of the early part of Otmore. Um, but it, it it changed the character, I would say, and there was a lot more hedgerows and a lot more structure, but the wildlife really wasn't impacted. And, and I think people continued to farm it in a very similar way. So moving the clock forward to the, um, to the war years, this is the Second World War, and this is where the MOD actually purchased some large, or, or acquired some large sections of Otmore, and they used it for bombing practice. Um, so they're like practice dropping their dummy bombs out on a target in the middle of the moor, but they also put lights out in the centre of the moor and the idea was to direct the German bombers 
to drop their bombs on Otmore rather than the important kind of um, factories that are operating in, in Oxford. Um, and there is, there is a story that, that, that's been told that the evacuees, some evacuees come out from London and they, they, they lived in some of the villages or the towns around Otmore. And after a few nights of the bombing that was going on over overnight, they, they actually decided they'd go back to London. They felt safer in London than they did around Otmore. Um, but this, this picture here actually just shows one of the Second World War bombs, which, which has been kind of uncovered a lot more, but I'll, I'll come on to that a bit later. Um, the next period in history, you're looking at about the 60s and the 70s. Now, this was when there was a real drive from the government to become self-sufficient in food. Um, and, and they wanted to farm more areas of the country. And they were particularly targeting wetland areas because they, they wanted to drain them so that basically we could grow arable food and, and become much more self-sufficient. So, so farmers were encouraged to put their land into these drain, land drainage schemes. And all the, the hashed area on this slide I'm showing you, this is all the areas that were actually um, drained on, on the Otmore Basin. And it's probably about, I think it's about a third of the Otmore Basin. Um, they actually put flood banks around each of the fields, so they took them out of the flood plain, plain so they weren't flooded anymore when the river came down with, with, with high water levels, they didn't get flooded in that sense. And they also, um, they, they put in drainage pipes under the soil, which would take water to deep ditches around the edge of the fields, and then they had land drainage pumps, so all the stars on here were land drainage pumps that were installed, electric land drainage pumps. Um, which were installed to, to drain to drain the moor. Um, here we go. This one of the pictures. Some of these pumps are still operational today, and, and they're still working. So this was this was quite a big change to the Otmore Basin. I mean, we certainly when we look at it and we talk about the history of it, you know, there's no blame associated to any of the farmers that did this because they were being encouraged by the government to do it, and it was you know it was an important thing to do at the time. But it definitely did change the moor, and as you can see, a large part of it. Um, for wildlife reasons was, was you know, def definitely changed and it was impacted. And this is a picture of one of the combines actually going across it and, and taking the arable crop on the Otmore ba off, off the Otmore Basin. So moving the crop forward from the, the, the land drainage times, we're now looking at this stretch of road here. Now, I don't think there's probably anyone on the talk who hasn't driven along this stretch or been driven along this stretch of road. This is the M40. This is the cutting that goes through Aston Rowan Nature Reserve. Um, and back in the, the, the late 80s, early 80s, when they were looking at actually putting this road in, um, they actually designed it to go through the middle of Otmore. And they probably looked at the map and realised that there was no nobody living in the centre of Otmore, so it would be quite easy to take the road through the middle. Now, this was extremely unpopular um, because although a large part of Otmore had been damaged, you know, the wildlife had gone, there were still some really important areas of wildlife that hadn't been damaged. You know, it's two thirds of the moor was still was still effectively, you know, farmed in a way that, you know, the, the, the wildlife was still there. Um, so a lot of people were up in arms, a lot of naturalists were up, were up in arms, but also the Friends of the Earth group at Wheatley were very much in, in protest about this. And they come up with an idea to, to kind of prevent the road from going through Watmore. And they bought a very small field, um, which they called Alice's Meadow. Um, and this is actually linked to one of your talks you got later in the year, actually, with um, C.S. Lewis wrote Alice Through the Looking Glass and talked about this patchwork quilt of fields. And it was said that he kind of, you know, looked down on Otmore to kind of give his inspiration for that, that, that kind of description. Um, so they called it Alice's Meadow. And what they did, they basically sold very small sections of this field to people. So you could buy it for about a pound, I think it was. And then people were encouraged to sell their parts of Alice's Meadow to other people. So it ended up like, I think it's about three, four, five thousand people owned a set, you know, a part of Otmore or a part of Alice's Meadow. And the reason they did this, that the highways agency or the agency at the time, if they were wanting to, um, to a purchase, do um, compulsory purchase of this field, they would have to deal with all, say, 4,000 people that own the field. And it would be a really complex process to try and get hold of them and, and deal with them on the legal terms and stuff like that. And actually, the, the, the route of the motorway did change, fortunately, and it did kind of veer around Otmore, uh, which, which is fantastic news. But it's just, it's just a wonderful story, I think, about how, how Otmore, you know, through the ages has, has kind of 
um, kindled a passion and, and, and a lot of people trying to defend it and, and trying to fight the corner for it. Um, and that's even come up all the way up to today um, with the Oxford Cambridge arc and, and, and or, or the Link Road and Expressway. And people again have, have kind of been saying, no, we don't want it to go through Otmore. And um, you know, I'm sure like many of you know, you know, it's it, it, it's obviously not going to go through there, and it's, it's not happening at the moment. So, moving on time. So we're now looking um, in the early '90s, and this was when the RSPB were basically looking, reviewing how they did land purchases. So traditionally, they would buy places like this, which is which is Ramsey Island. Um, which is off, off the coast of Wales. And, you know, Ramsey Island is like a triple SI site. So it's a site of special scientific interest. You know, it's a very nice site. And the thing was, that was what RSPB always bought up until the early nineties, but they wanted to increase their reserve, you know, number of reserves they had. And they realized they needed to do something different because types of land like this come on the market very rarely. So they realized they had to buy land which had effectively been destroyed, but they could turn back to its former glory. Now, when I talk about this now in, you know, in 2021, I'm sure many of you have probably heard of stories of great, great restoration stories of pieces of land that RSPB done or wildlife trusts have done or other organizations have, have kind of restored. But back in the early 90s, this, this was revolutionary stuff. Um, it really was quite an incredible idea to take an area of land that's been destroyed and we're going to turn it back to wildlife. It'll take a lot of investment and a lot of work to do it, but, but the RSPB were prepared to do it. And they, they drew up this list of, um, of, of sites across the country. And Otmore was in one of the top five sites that, they, I, that they, they thought that they could do this with. And the reason they liked Otmore was it's a very big area. As I said, it's about 1400 hectares with, with not a lot in the middle. So that means Whatever they started could get bigger and bigger and bigger, which is great. We all know in nature conservation size is very important in trying to save um, wildlife and, and trying to create nature reserves. We need to do things at a bigger scale. So that, that was important. There was scope to kind of expand it. But the other bit, which was really important, is this, this area here, the danger area. You can see in the middle here where all these red triangles are. This denotes the range, the, the firing range, the MOD firing range. They've got the rifle range here, and then they have this big block of land behind in case the soldiers miss the targets and the bullets go off in the distance. Um, but this piece of land, the MOD land, is like much of the MOD land across the country. And it is really, really good for wildlife. And the reason it's good for wildlife is that it's never been improved. It's been farmed at a very um, basic level. They've not put a lot of inputs in to try and improve it, to make it a, a high-end farming area because the focus has been um, the army, the RAF, whoever uses it, and it's about using it for military purposes and not to try and get the maximum yield for food out of it. So these areas like Salisbury Plain and the Low Wolf Ranges, you know, and Otmore have actually been not improved and the wildlife is really good. And the RSPB knew that a lot of the wildlife we were interested in for the habitats we were looking to create um, were, were already in this area. So the birds, such as the, the lapwing, would literally just have to fly over the hedgerow and join the new areas of the reserve that we were looking at. So, so that, that was what, what they were interested in. So in, that's about 95, 96, they did all of this work. They then started to write to landowners. And then in 97, they bought the very first field, which is this one here. And it included this block up here, which is our reed bed. It wasn't a reed bed then, this was all arable field. And then from 97 up until 2005, we gradually added more pieces to the reserve. We've acquired them um you know and being able to kind of you know add them to our you know to the reserve holding um two five, since 2005 it, it's gone a bit quiet and we haven't really added any more areas but in um, a couple of years ago we actually acquired this piece here which you can still see, you can see sits within the danger area but it's actually part of the mod land um but it is um we are we've become tenants on it so we we lease this from the mod and this is really exciting because obviously this is a really nice kind of a real wild wildlife area with some really good wildlife on. So the reserve holding now is, is up to 462 hectares, 1,142 acres, which is, which is a pretty good size for Southern England. I mean, you know, the RSPB have some really big reserves, don't get me wrong, you know, up in Scotland, they got like 10, 20,000 hectare reserves, but that's a different scale up there. When you're talking about Southern England to have 462 hectares of land um, managed as a, as a nature reserve is, is pretty impressive. 
So I'm now going to go into detail a bit more about the habitats that we, we've looked at and created. So the two main habitats we've tried to create on these arable areas, um, one of them is called floodplain grazing marsh. Now it sounds a very glamorous term, it's effectively wet grassland. Now wet grassland is a really important habitat in this country and we used to have an awful lot more of it. Um, they reckon there used to be about 1.2 million hectares and now it's probably down to about 220,000 hectares is left. So we, this is a habitat that declined across the country and, and it's declined for several reasons. Some of them are explained earlier are to do with um, drainage and people trying to drain it, but also people are trying to build on it as well. Um, so that there is a lot of pressure on the wetland areas and, and it's gradually shrinking what we've got. Um, and that's why we're trying to restore it and return this habitat back to its former glory. Now, the second habitat that we've tried to create or we've created on Artmore is a reed bed. Uh, is, is reed, reed bed. And again, it's another habitat that's been lost across the country as we've gradually drained areas, but it's, an, it's a habitat that's on its comeback. Um, and since 2013, we, there's been about 1500 hectares of new reed bed has been created. So it's a habitat we've put a lot of work into creating um, and, and it's, it's, it's on the comeback. It's on the comeback, but it's still not enough of it. So they're, they're the two kind of main habitats that we've been working on. So I'm going to chat to you about some of the, the hazards and the hiccups that we've had along the way. Now, I think when we started out on the journey with Otmore, the RSPB, we knew it was going to be difficult. We knew it was going to be hard because we've never done stuff like this before. You know, we were bringing people in who knew lots about wildlife, but major engineering works, major um, uh, kind of create habitat creation works just hadn't been done. So, um, so we knew that we were going to probably make some mistakes along the way. We did make some mistakes, but as we've progressed, we've got better at it. But some of the things we've had to deal with have been things like unexploded ordnance. I've explained earlier about the, the, the issue with um, or the use of, of Otmore as a firing, as a bombing range. Um, I've had bomb disposal out numerous times and I've had more time, I could tell you from wonderful stories of dealing with, with unexploded ordnance on the reserve. I mean, this, this is a particular one, I won't go into all the details, but this particular bomb, um, which we found, which had a, a a live um, detonator on and it, everything indicated it was a live bomb, took us about two days to deal with. We were trying to seek Secretary of State's approval at one point to do a, a detonation of it because of the airspace over the top. It took three attempts to blow it up and eventually it was discovered it was full of concrete and it was actually a dummy bomb that just had a detonator on it. So um, we've also hit, um, we have actually come across whilst digging holes with spades um, a very small detonator which blew the end of one of the spades while a volunteer was using. So um, it's definitely a very real risk and it's something we've had to continually work with the whole way through. Um, other things we've come across, archaeology, very small parts of the reserve have, have, have shown some, some really interesting kind of Roman archaeology, um, which is, you know, really, really fascinating stuff. But obviously, if we wanted to dig holes, we had to work with archaeology, archaeologists first who had to check areas before we were allowed to kind of dig, dig the areas that we wanted to dig to create the ponds and the, the ditches and stuff that we wanted to create. Um, and finally, one of the big problems we've had is the Otmore clay. Now, Otmore clay has become notorious to earth moving contractors in Oxfordshire. Um, in the early days, we would often come up with a design and say we wanted to create this and a lot of the earth moving contractors would say, oh yeah, we'll come down, we'll do that in the winter, that won't be any problem, yeah, we can do that. And, and they would come down with their machinery and they would try and do it in the winter and they ended up with situations like this where, you know, this was just porridge, this was like liquid mud, it was horrendous. Um, and, and they tried to do it in the winter months and they just failed. I mean, this particular field, I think it took about three attempts of the contractor to finally finish the contract. And, and nowadays, if ever I'm doing any kind of work like this or not more, absolutely number one on the list is you're doing it in the summer. You can come on in, in late July and you've got to be off by, by September, end of September, because, you know, we, we know what this clay is like and it is notorious. Um, and when it gets wet, it just sits on the surface and it is, it is really horrendous to work with. However, the clay actually works to our favours because it also holds water really well. And when we dig our ponds and our ditches, this is what we have. Water which is held perfectly in the clay. It doesn't drain away. Clay soil is known for, for kind of uh, for, for retaining water. And um, um, this, I, I love this aerial picture. For those of you who have probably walked around Otmore, you've probably walked along the Bridleway along here. The Hyde 
is kind of over off to the side over here is the hide. This is what we call the Ashgrave field. Um, when you walk along there, you don't quite realize, I think, how much water is, is out there. And it is incredibly wet. Um, and you say when you walk across it in your wellies, especially in the winter, you realize just how many wet features have been created. But you, as I say, you don't always realize that when you're, when you're standing on, on the ground looking out, but, but it's, it's, it's incredible what's been created. Um, you can almost age it um, as a, almost a bit of a piece of work, work of art or something like that. Because, you know, as we've had different machinery and different pieces of kit, the technology's improved. We've used different styles and techniques to create what we've created. But as I say, each time we've done it, we've got better and better and it really improved it. And it is it's absolutely fantastic what's been created. So that, that's the wet grassland areas. I'm now going to talk about the reed bed, which is actually this, this top bit up the top here. Now, this was a genius idea that somebody came up with because when we originally designed the reserve designed the reserve we, we come we did a water budget calculation and we worked out how much rainfall we were going to get and then what the typical evapotranspiration was going to be how much water was going to disappear in the spring and the summer and we could work out whether we were going to have enough water to create well to hold onto all of these wet areas here and we realized that there were going to be some years that actually it was going to dry out and we weren't going to have enough water. We also knew that with climate change, this is back in the back in the 90s, we were talking about this, but with climate change and the predictions that were being put back then that we were going to have, you know, warmer, drier periods in the summer, that evapotranspiration was going to be much greater. So we needed to find a way of storing water um, so that we could release, we could store the winter water and then release it into the the, the wet grassland areas as, as it got hotter, you know, in the spring. So we decided we're going to put a reservoir in. So that's what this block of land up here, but rather than having an open water reservoir, somebody said, well, why don't we turn it into a reed bed? Because that's a really important habitat to have alongside wet grassland. Of those two habitats, we know reed beds decline, we can turn it into a reed bed. And by doing it in, as a reed bed, we were able to then um, access EU life money because it was an important habitat that had declined and they basically agreed to fund it. So the reed bed was actually partly funded by European money on, as part of EU life. So, so we constructed the reed bed and this is how it looked in the early days because it was just bare soil. It was on an arable field basically. So we had to grow the reed. So we collected the reed seeds from the uh, edge of the reserve, around the ditches around the edge. We had a polytunnel that we grew the seedlings in, and then we would plant them out. It almost looked like a bit like a paddy field almost, with, with a little dibber, you'd plant a row of reed like this. Um, there were tiny plants, this one's several, several years old this would be, but there were tiny little plugs basically. And you could plant a, a row of plugs in about an hour. We had the local community, you see the volunteers up here, loads of people come down, children, everyone of all ages come down and, and messed about in the Otmore mud and, and planted these plants. But you could do it in about half an hour. You could put a nice row of uh, reed plugs in. But the problem was if you went back the next day, the geese had come in and they'd eaten them all and pulled them all out. And it was an oh, absolute pain. So we had to put these nets up. So it took half an hour to plant that line of reed but you'd probably spend the next two, three hours trying to net it. And then we had to keep checking the nets to make sure they were working. We ended up planting 150,000 plugs. It took us about seven years to do, but this is what we've ended up with. And this is, this is the Northern phase of the reed bed. And you can see it is literally wall to wall reed. It is incredible. When I started on Otmore back in about 2004, you can walk from one end to the other fairly easily. It'll be muddy, but you could walk. Now to walk from there to there is, is almost impossible. The reed is way above your head. It's all tangled up as well. And it is amazing to think that this habitat's been created in Oxfordshire with, with the work of volunteers, engineers and stuff like that. And that's, that's what we've got out there. And again, when you visit the reserve, you don't quite realize the extent of the reed bed and how big it is. It's about 22 hectares, this reed bed. So that's the engineering work. So I'm sure you know some of you are out there quite interested in, in kind of how we've worked through that. I'm now going to take you through the seasons and talk about some of the work we do and some of the wildlife that we find. Um, so I'm going to start in winter. Now, I personally think that Otmore is one of the coldest places in, in, in Oxfordshire in the winter. I, I really want to get a thermometer and take a permanent reading out there to, to really prove my case um, because it is bitter. I mean, Otmore is a place of extreme. In the summer, it's absolutely boiling hot and in the winter it is freezing cold i mean some people have written that there's no high ground between otmore and the urals and when the wind blows from the east it's coming straight from the urals and and trust me when you're out there in in about 
January and that wind's blowing from the east and it's frozen ice as well on the reed bed. It is absolutely freezing. So the first job we do actually at the beginning of the year in January is monitoring for butterflies. Yep, you heard me straight. You heard me correct there. Um, we actually do a butterfly survey and um, this is a group of butterfly conservation volunteers and they're actually looking for butterfly eggs. Um, I always find it funny that the first survey we do is for butterfly and it's in January, but they're looking for eggs and they're looking for the egg of the brown hair streak, which likes to grow on young black fawn. Um, here's a picture of the egg here. It's tiny. It's the size of a pinhead and they lay it in the fork of the branch of a black fawn head, uh, tree bush. And here we are. This is the um, adult butterfly, the, the, the brown hair streak butterfly. And um, it's very difficult to see this butterfly and the traditional butterfly survey techniques don't really pick it up because it often flies very high up in ash trees and you don't really see it. Um, so it's very difficult to pick up, but they found that by looking for the eggs in the winter, you can get a really good idea of the population and how the population is doing. So that, that, that's, that's, that's what we do in, at that time of year. I think it's important to kind of highlight this point that the RSPB isn't just about birds. You know, we, we manage the reserve for a whole variety of wildlife. And we also work in partnership with organizations like Butterfly Conservation um, to, to kind of, you know, get the best survey work, get the best management advice to kind of manage, manage the reserve. Now, the hedgerow management is what we do in the winter. So obviously we're doing it in the winter because we don't want to impact on nesting birds and, and stuff like that. So we do it in the winter, but most of the hedgerow work we do is actually designed for the butterflies. And, and this is a classic ecological problem that I face all the time on, on a reserve is that the brown hair streak butterflies like really young black fawn and the black hair streak butterflies like really old black fawn. So we've got these two species of butterfly, which are really important for Oxfordshire. We've got a very strong population in Oxfordshire, but they're not spread across the rest of the country. So this kind of swathe of Oxfordshire, Northamptonshire, Buckinghamshire area is, is the stronghold for them. Um, so we need to try and meet the needs of both of them. So we end up with very long rotational coppices. So we do, often it can be up to 20 years, 30 years, even 50 years. So we try and do a section of the hedgerow every year, but we just do a small section so that we get this variety of ages throughout. So other things to think about just in winter or not more is, is the raptors, the birds of prey. Um, and again, winter is a really good time for, for spotting them. Um, we've got the top left up there, we've got the merlin. Um, we've got top right, we've got the peregrine. And then we obviously, I'm sure everyone here can recognize the barn owl, which is in the bottom left. And then we have the hen harrier here, which is in the bottom right. Um, and these are just a selection of the birds of prey that can be seen in the wind. So obviously we have kestrels, um, we have sparrowhawks, we have um, a marsh harrier, another one that we have. So, you know, there's a tawny owls, short-eared owls, there's a whole variety of birds of prey. And it's, again, it's just fantastic to see them kind of using them all. Um, and, and the opportunity to see a, a hen harrier kind of just hen hunting over the grassland is amazing. And this is an incredibly persecuted bird. And yet it comes down most winters, we get hen harriers on the moor and you can see them. I mean, the Merlin is so difficult to see and yet it is there, most years it's there, but this is a small bird about the size of a song thrush, very small, very difficult to see, but it can be, you know, it is there and it is around. So that's, that's kind of the winter months. I'm just going to take you through into spring. Um, and that's where we have um, a very good spectacle is, is the brown hares. And when they're boxing, we have a brilliant population of brown hare on Otmore. There's probably about 50, I think there's about 50 individuals on, on the Otmore Basin. So it's one of the largest populations in Oxfordshire. Um, and, and in the springtime is great because you get to see them when they're doing their boxing. Now, I'm sure many of you already know this, but the boxing actually isn't between two males. It's actually, it's the female who's boxing away the male um, and she's doing it to kind of find the strongest and the fittest male. And it sometimes it can look quite brutal because she has been absolutely harassed by three, four, five different males are chasing her around, chasing her around. But it is it's quite a spectacle to watch. I would late, the, the, the brown hairs are on Otmore all year round. And um, sometimes, you know, later in the year or in the winter months, you can actually get really nice close views of them. I mean, you know, they're, they're beautiful mammals, um, which, which are not doing brilliant again in the countryside. They're not doing amazing. The numbers are low, um, but on Otmore, they are doing really, really well. So in the springtime on Otmore, we spend a lot of our time doing the surveys because obviously we work for the RSPB and the breeding birds are really important because they're an indicator of how well the reserves being managed. So 
the birds that we have the, that we're particularly interested in and the real indicators for us of the wet grassland are the waders. So I'm going to run through some of the waders now. So this is the red shank. Um, it's got these these red, orangey red legs. That's why it's called red shank. Um, you have a, you can also get a green shank, which has green legs, but this is the red shank. Um, and, and they have this fantastic piping call and um, often call them the sentinels of the wetland. Because when you first go out in the misty morning, the red shank are often the first to see you. And they'll do this piping call to really kind of draw attention that, that an intruder has entered the moor. And I mean, this is the most beautiful time of year on Otmore. And you know, when we're heading out to do the surveys, you know, we're incredibly tired because we have to get up very, very early to do it. We're up at sunrise, um, but it is amazing as that mist is lifting and you can hear birds like this one, which is the curlew. Um, and that bubbling song flight of the curlew is, is just amazing. And it just, it just gets better. So you've got the red shank pipe and then you have the bubbling call of the curlew, which I think a lot of people are quite surprised because they often associate it with the coastal areas, but they do breed inland and Otmore has got an important breeding population. But then you also get this bird here, which is a snipe. Okay, now the, the snipe has the most bizarre, it's not really cool, but kind of the noise that it makes because it is called drumming. And basically it, the, the male does a display and it will fly around roughly in a circle and it will fly really, really high and then it will drop down. And as it drops down, these two feathers here make a drumming sound, okay? And it, it, it's, it's very eerie. And if you didn't know what it was, you know, you just think, what on earth is that weird sound? And it, I will try and imitate it, but it's going to sound terrible. But it kind of sounds a bit like a do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. And then it'll go up again, and then it'll go do 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 And it kind of does this incredible sound. As I say, it's just doing it with the tail feathers. And, you know, these birds are breeding on Otmore. The closest birds that snipe, which are breeding to Otmore, are over in the... Um, the Cambridgeshire fens or over down to the Somerset levels. And that's the only places they breed, you know, across the cross, you know, close to us. And Otmore holds a population of breeding snipe, which is amazing. And we're working our socks off to try and maintain this population. And then we've also got the lapwing. And I'm sure many of you know the lapwing. This is one sat on a nest, again, a really important bird. And this one's been a good one for us because we've been able to um, monitor it and, main, and, and kind of um, to see how the population is, has been going. Um, and the way we monitor the lapwing, we obviously do the, the surveys of just seeing the birds and counting the birds, but we also put cameras on their nests. So this is a lapwing nest here, and you've got a little camera here. And we've done this because we noticed that our lapwing population started to decline. And it kind of went up in the early days and then it dropped off and we wanted to find out what was going on. And we put the cameras out and we found that foxes were a major predator, but we also found that badgers were a major predator. This was a bit more of a surprise, but it wasn't that much of a surprise, but it turned out these two predators are the kind of the biggest predators of the lapwing on the Otmore Basin. And particularly with the badgers, it's on a dry spring. When it's a dry spring, they head down to the moor where it's wetter, easier for digging earthworms, and they also come across the, the eggs. Now, it's, it's hard work when we're doing all this monitoring work, we're watching the lapwings, uh, their nests, and it gets to the point of hatching. That's often the point when the predators can hear them as the chicks chipping in the egg, and, and then they get predated. But when you come up to a nest cup, and you see these beautiful fluffy chicks, it's amazing and it's just like fantastic. They're on another step on the way of, to survival. So quickly going to show you some graphs of our, our populations and I talked to you earlier about the kind of the rise in the, the lapwing population and this, th that was fantastic and then we have this massive drop off here um, and this is where we did this research work, we found out what the problem was um, and then we actually put in a, a fence, a predator fence around one of our fields, covers about 40 hectares. And that was put in around about 2010 and you can see the impact it's had. Now, now things have dropped off again. So we're coming to work out again, what's going on. But, um, but I think this year it's kind of gone back up again. So it's kind of improving, but it's still a bit of up and down and we expect it to be a bit of up and down. Um, I think the important thing to notice here, the snipe have gone up, the red shank have gone up, but the only bird that we haven't made an impact on with is the curlew. And the reason for that is that the curlew like, on Otmore, they like the really old grassland areas. And I call them ancient grassland because I kind of associate them with ancient woodland. Um, and the reason they like these ancient grassland is the soils are really good quality and they're good for probing for invertebrates like worms. But also when they've got chicks on the ground, they've got really high numbers of invertebrates, surface invertebrates like grasshoppers. And when you walk across a field that the curlew nests in, the, the grass ward is just erupting with grasshoppers hopping along. And our fields are very much like a plantation woodland. They're still very young and they don't have that number of invertebrates. And also the other part is the curlew are very site faithful. 
And until their population starts to increase on the basin, they're not going to spread out into our areas. But we're starting to um, make some changes with Curlew and we've been working, um, well, one of the advantages we've had recently is that we acquired the MOD tenancy I told you about, and that's a real hot spot for Curlew. So we've been working on finding their nests and instead of doing a, a fence across a whole field, because that would only probably protect about two pairs, which isn't very much, and it costs a lot of money. We do these temporary fences, which is literally a 20 meter square that goes around a curly nest in the middle there. We put it up once we found the nest. Um, so the nest is protected. When the chicks hatch, they leave the nest. They can get out the fence, absolutely no problem. Even though it's electrified, they can still get out. It's not a problem. And we're giving them a better chance of survival. And here's an example here is a couple of curly chicks, which, uh, which are hatching, which is, which have hatched. And I encourage you to invite me back in about 10 years time um, to civic society and I'll come back and talk. And hopefully I can prove that the curly will have increased in numbers and we've actually done our bit for saving curly. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. So quickly moving on. So I'm just conscious of time, but I've got so much more to tell you. Um, this is another bird, um, which, traditionally has been good on Otmore. It's called the turtle dove. Now, every year I've worked at Otmore and every year the RSPB have been there, the turtle doves have bred on Otmore, um, which has been fantastic. However, the problem is with the turtle dove, they've had a massive decline across the country. And since the seventies, their population has crashed by 95% in the UK. Um, the reason the population has gone down is they're being shot on migration, their migration routes, they're being shot, um, but also, research has shown that basically the chicks the, the 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 females used to have kind of probably up to three three broods a year but they're finding nowadays that she probably only has about one or two so she, the number of broods that she's having each year is less so this means there's less birds going into the population and the reason she's having less broods is that the food that she used to feed on which was weed seeds very tiny seeds there's not as much weed we there's not as many weeds in the countryside anymore and um, and basically they're struggling to have as many broods as they used to have. So the RSPB are pro a project called Operation Turtle Dove, and they're working on this to try and um, improve. Well, one is they're working with with um, the shooting uh, in, in across across Europe. They're, they're doing some really good stuff on that side of things, but also they're looking at the food in their breeding grounds. And a lot more, we've actually sown a crop which has specifically got small weedy plants in like fuming tree and bird's foot trefoil. And we also scatter seed as well. And we've been doing that for a number of years and, and we thought things were going well, but I have some really sad news to share with you. And it's not all good news in conservation, I'm afraid. This bird didn't turn up on Otmore this year. And that's the first time we've ever had it, have ever had that situation. And we know they breed over the border in Buckinghamshire, not far from us. And he didn't turn up in Buckinghamshire either. And I think this is the stark reality of what is happening in our countryside. You know, this is a bird that the, the issue of it is we're on the edge of the range and the range is shrinking eastwards and it's going, you know, so now, you know, there, there's lots of them still in Sussex, there's lots of them down in Kent, but the people on the edge of the range, like Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, they're moving inwards. And that's, that's what's going to happen until we get that solution and we can find the absolute holy grail of solution of how we can get them to have more broods and how we can get them to survive the, the hunting grounds, you know, we're not going to see that bird increase. Um, so it's, it's an absolute tragic shame, but we have to be honest about this. We can't just talk about amazing things. Anyway, I must whistle on because I've got loads to talk about. Amphibian numbers have gone through the roof because we've created all those ponds and so newts and frogs and toads have increased. As the newts, pond, uh, frogs and toads have increased, the grass snakes have increased because they've been feeding on them. And, um, you know, you can get really good views of grass snakes in the spring. Um, you can see them basking in the sun. Um, other things that we've seen an increase in uh, is, is some of the wild flowers. And this is the green winged orchid. And this flower actually grows often on, on talks about kind of the ancient hay meadows. Uh, I talked about some of those earlier. This, that, this is an indicator of grows in some of those, those fields, but actually this, photo was taken on one of our restored arable fields and I count we the count volunteers did the count this year and we had about 60 green winged orchids in this field which is amazing to see these orchids kind of coming back to this former arable land so moving on to the summer talking a bit about spring there but now we're going into the summer and that's where these animals come onto reserve the cattle are, are down and they're, they're an important tool for us they're a grazing tool and it's important that they graze the grassland and create the right sward for our breeding waders 
but we also have the tractor in as well. So we literally have just hired the tractor. We picked it up today. We hire it in from the beginning of July all the way through to the end of October. And that's when we're out doing cutting the grass and we're aerating the soil and rotivating the edges of the ponds to create muddy areas. You know, we work solidly with this tractor from, you know, for that period we have it on hire, you know, we literally try and come in at seven in the morning and we're there till seven at night trying to get a maximum amount of work done as we can. Really, really busy period. Um, Obviously, again, with the amount of ponds and that that we've created, the dragonfly population have done very well. We've got 19 species of dragonfly on the reserve. Um, this is the brown hawker. But along with the dragonflies, we've also seen birds such as this. This is a hobby here. And, um, and they, they feast on the dragonflies. They love to have dragonflies. They're amazing. They're, they're like acrobats in the sky as they grab a dragonfly in flight. They strip off the wings. If you watch them closely with binoculars, they strip off the wings and then eat the body. Um, and they'll just fly around and feasting on these dragonflies. So that, that's the summer period. I'm now moving into the autumn and um, that's when the hedgerows come alive with berries and we get the winter thrushes such as the red wings and the field fairs are coming in. If you're really, really lucky, you can see otter again in the early days, hardly ever had a record of otter and now they're very common. We've, you know, I've seen them numerous times kind of swimming along the channels around the reed bed. And what's really nice is visitors have seen them. It's not just reserve staff who go to the back corners of the reserve, actually visitors are seeing the, the otters as well. And we've seen them with young as well, which is, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and then in the wind, kind of moving into the autumn and kind of going into the, the winter, this is when our wildfowl numbers increase as well. And, and again, we have phenomenal numbers of wintering wildfowl. Um, we can have up to three, 4,000 widgeon and teal. We get up to numbers of about 6,000 wintering golden plover and lapwing. We actually have nationally important numbers of shoveler and golden plover using art more. And again, let's just focus this this is an inland site that we've got these numbers of birds using um, and it is again it's a spectacle to see and in the in the winter time we do the reed cut as well and I must do a special mention quickly to the the volunteers because we have an army of volunteers over 100 people volunteer on more whether it's the practical stuff or whether they're talking to people around the reserve kind of just sharing the stories of Otmore again it's really important right really conscious of time um, but I, I do want to share with you some real success stories or, or, or kind of some specific stuff. So these two birds here, are, these are cranes, okay? A common crane. And, and they arrived on the reserve for the first time in 2015. Um, and they're part of the Great Crane Project, which is down in the Somerset levels. Now, basically what they did, they, they took some eggs from, um, from Germany. They brought them over, the RSPB with the Wildfowl Wetland Trust. And they basically hatched these eggs and reared them in an aviary. And then they, they basically released them into the wild. And they did this for a good number of years. And, um, and these birds are, are doing quite well. They're actually spreading across the countryside, but they, they turned up, a pair turned up in 2015 and it was really exciting. Um, they've actually got names. This pair is, is called uh, Wycliffe and Maple Glory. They were named by local school children. They've got color rings on. You can just see a ring here. So that enabled us to kind of identify them. Um, and, and they've attempted to nest each year on, on the reserve. Now, I, I was, you probably noticed I said the word attempted. They haven't been successful yet. Um, here's one of the nest locations, actually. They like to nest in a reedy area. You can see the nest here. This is a failed nest. You can actually see a, a broken eggshell there. Um, but they haven't been successful to date. Um, and actually, last year, we actually had two pairs of cranes attempting to breed, which is amazing. But again, they haven't been successful. The best we've got to so far is seven weeks. Um, now, this is hot off the press. We do this year. We only had one pair breed. There's been a bit of shenanigans going on. And again, I could tell you a long story. I'm not going to tell you it all. But basically, only one pair nested on the reserve this year. That one pair have actually got a chick. Now, this is a chick probably about three or four weeks ago when it was newly hatched. It's still fairly young. Hot off the press. We, we keep we try and avoid going near these birds because they are so shy. Um, they, they're so secretive and they hate disturbance. So we very rarely go out to them, but we hadn't had a sighting for two weeks. So today we actually went out to have a look for them and we actually come across an, a chick and the, this chick is still alive at the moment. It's five weeks old, coming up to six weeks. It's probably standing probably about two foot tall, two and a half foot tall. So it's doing very well at the moment. Um, but we're just we're just crossing everything we've got because we want this chick to be successful. Um, so we'll just see what happens. I mean, I've become fairly 
I've had to, we've had to deal with a lot of um, disappointment with them, but but fingers crossed they're going to do it this year. It is is so exciting, and if these birds bred in on Otmore in Oxfordshire, it will be the first successful breeding of cranes for a very hundred years, which is which is again in its story in itself is amazing. Um, going to quickly jump on to this bird, which is Marsh Harrier, and actually this is really interesting because the first year. Um, that the cranes arrived or not more. We put all our attentions onto the crane and actually we didn't quite realize that Marsh Harrier bred successfully that year. Um, and we only realized it when they had the juveniles and they were flying around. We're like, hang on a minute, there's juvenile Marsh Harriers there. Um, and again, they were the first, first time Marsh Harriers had bred in Oxfordshire for over 200 years. Um, and this is a species of bird which has seen massive de declines across the country and it is gradually on the comeback and doing really, really well. And another bird which is which is doing really well and is, is on the comeback is the bittern. And again, the following year, so 2015 was when the cranes first bred and the marsh harriers first bred. In 2016, we had the first breeding bittern in, in Oxfordshire for over 200 years. Um, and again, this bird is, is, is like a heron-like bird. If those of you don't know about them, you know, there's this brown, very secretive bird that skulk around in the reed bed but they have this most incredible call. It's called a boom. Um, and it's, we, we call them booming bitterns. And the male has this booming sound, which kind of comes out over, over the reed bed. And, and it's amazing to hear. And this year we actually had three boomers on Otmore. Um, again, which is a remarkable success story. These birds, like the marsh harriers, have actually fledged young as well. Um, you know, and at the moment we're trying to track down what they're up to this year. They've been quite tricky this year to try and work out what they're up to. But, um, but again, it is amazing in the springtime to walk around Otmore and hear bitterns booming. The cranes do this incredible bugling sound. You've got drumming snipe, you've got bubbling curlew trumpeting red shank it is it's just an amazing experience um and as i say i, I encourage you to come down and explore up more it is a magical place we have amazing volunteers whose job you know they, they, they volunteer on a, on a rotor system and they'll walk around the reserve you'll see them with a badge on and if you're an inexperienced bird watcher you don't know what you're doing have a chat with them these are amazing people who will just happily share with you the success stories of up more but also the incredible wildlife that's out there as well. I mean, it is, it is a truly remarkable place. Um, so I'm going to end my talk there and I think we're going to go to questions and I think Ian's going to help with questions, aren't you? Should I stop sharing my screen, Ian? Would that be helpful or should I keep the sunset up? I don't mind. Uh, yeah, maybe you should stop sharing your screen and then we can see you fully. <laughs> I'm not sure you want to see that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Thank you, David. And, and, uh, Thank you for trying to get it into an hour. There's so much to talk about. Um, and uh, yeah, and to, to hear the latest news about things like the turtle dove, but the exciting news about the crane, it's, it's, it shows both sides of the, the conservation um, struggle, doesn't it really? Um, and we have had a few questions coming in on Q&A. So people can keep uh, typing in on that, or if you want to raise your hand, I can also unmute you and allow you to ask it yourself. So. Let me just go to the, some of the questions we've had in already. The, the couple on the theme of, of rewilding. So these are from Hugh Lee and Roger Chambers. And they're both the same theme really saying, um, what are the pros and cons of a managed reserve versus re rewilding, which is what maybe the MOD has sort of ac accidentally done. And, and does, what about the idea that, you know, we shouldn't have to be buying land to, to um, create nature reserves, but that we should be aspiring to a time when nature just gets on with it itself How, what do you think about that yeah i mean rewilding is a huge topic at the moment and everyone's everyone's talking about it in conservation and i think this is this is my view about rewilding i think it's got to be done at scale and at a very large scale um to be able to truly allow a piece of land to kind of you know to do its own thing with with herbivores that are going through and grazing it and kind of allowing overgrazing it undergrazing it and allowing that that flux that happens of kind of things growing and coming down and and kind of getting that you need to do it over a very large area of land and although you know i talked about oh what more is 462 hectares and in my eyes it's still not big enough to do rewilding of of what i believe that rewilding should be um i think a lot of people see rewilding as just allowing a, a scrubby bit in your cor in the corner of your garden or something like that um but as i say my my view personal view of rewilding I, I don't think that's that's what it is and i think 
we're in a situation where the species that I've talked about, you know, particularly, you know, the snipe and the curlew and stuff like that, they, they are still needing a managed nature reserve situation. And it's not that they're across the whole wider countryside area and you can allow kind of that flux to kind of go up and down and, and allow some of their areas to be sacrificed and that they, you know, that we, we just let it go. Because if we do that, we, we're in danger of actually losing those species and to get them back is a huge amount of work. So, so Otmore is different. It's, it's not a rewilding type of project. Um, and it is a, a nature reserve, which is managed and it's managed for those particular habitats, which I talked about. Um, and I would even say the MOD areas, they're not rewilding at all. They've still been farmed. They've still been managed throughout all of their history that they've been there. They're still cut for hay. We've got some amazing hay meadows on there, but they've all been cut for hay every year. Um, and they have been for decades and decades. Um, you know, they're still grazed with livestock as well. Um, so they are still very much managed in a sense for that to create that, that habitat management. And if, if land does become available around the reserve, you're still looking at you to expand if you can. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult topic um, and we don't we haven't put a pin in the map and say we want to buy everything because we've got to be, you know, people live and work there and, and stuff like that, you know, and we are working with with local local farmers, you know, the, the curdy stuff I've talked about, the fencing and that we're doing that with, with local farmers and, and you know, they're, they're allowing us to come onto their land and do the fencing on, on their land. And we're working with local farmers and advising them about, you know, how how to manage for wildlife as well. So. It's, it's not a question of owning everything. It's about, you know, supporting the, the, the other landowners around and trying to support them to try and, you know, where they can do improvements and do stuff for wildlife. I think that, that's important as well. Just a couple of questions on species specific questions. Um, Penelope Clark asks if there's any kind of problem with the red kites and the way they've sort of expanded their range. Yeah. yeah, that's a really interesting one. And actually where I showed you kind of that that graph that shows the lapwing going down is something that we've now noticed and um the the fenced area that we put in the kites are now coming in and taking the wader chicks and we're, we're starting to kind of see that impact and actually we, we noticed this quite a few years ago and um we actually have, have run the rspb run a conservation science team actually have run a project on that and they're kind of monitoring it and they're about to release a paper. I won't say too much about it now, but they have done a monitoring project and have done a. Um, they're going to release a, a, a paper in a local in, in a journal with with what they've been doing. But it is definitely something that we have noticed, and we've been trialing some ideas um, to deal with that. But as I say, I won't go into too much detail now about that. If that's okay. Um, and then a question from Priscilla Goldby on uh, what's the best time of day to see otters. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some insight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is an impossible question to answer. It is genuinely luck. It is down to luck. Um, you know, I don't even think it's, it's, it's early mornings or evenings or anything like that. Um, I would probably say, if I'd give you one piece of advice, something which I personally feel happens is that when there is a major flood in, in, the, in the catchment and the rivers are, you know, are, of a kind of burst their banks and all the fields are flooded i personally think that our reed bed is a place that the otters go to and it may be that they just find it easier to find the fish because you know the fish are still within the channels of our reed bed because we don't get affected by a flood in the reed bed area and it, it does seem to me when there is that flood situation that we often get more records of otter but it's it is impossible it is really it's just luck and um yeah that's when to hear a bit a bit and booming that's the other question What's the best time of day to try and do that? Oh, well, best time. Yeah. So bit and booming is definitely kind of April, April time, um, April into May as well. Um, and early morning or evenings are definitely better. Um, but when they're in full, full booming session, you know, that you can hear them all, all, all day long. You know, they can do it all day long. But yeah, definitely it's the springtime, you know, April, April, April time is probably the best to get them. But yeah, they're, they're yeah, amazing sound. And uh, one more question from uh, Heather Armitage. Is there a problem with the commercial shooting range nearby? Do they shoot protected species? Yeah, so, sorry, I'm just reading the question because you cut out a bit here and I think I'll get a bit, uh, problem with the commercial shooting range nearby. No, no, the, the, if you're meaning the MOD firing range, um, they only shoot in targets. So they're not actually shooting the wildlife. They're, they're literally just shooting cardboard 
soldiers that pop up. Um, so yeah, so there's not a problem with that. And even with disturbance, I mean, sometimes they're shooting with some quite big guns and it sounds quite loud. It doesn't seem to have a major impact on the birds. They seem to get fairly used to it. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't, they're, they're not shooting the wildlife. So that's not, a, not an impact. So Heather says she doesn't mean the MOD. She's just added another comment. So there must be some other shooting that goes on nearby. I don't know if there's maybe um, game shooting or... Yeah, so I mean, we've we've got some we've got various pheasant shoots which go on around the moor, um, and there is some some landowners do duck shooting as well, so that does happen. Um, but again, we we don't notice that it's made a, a massive impact on the wildlife. Um, we've not seen huge, you know, the numbers that they're, you know, certainly the pheasant shooting we're not noticing a direct impact on the reserve, um, and and certainly the duck shooting. I mean, we are talking very low numbers that are shot, very very low numbers. Um, yeah. So just to end, just there's a comment here from Roger Chambers, who's just urging everyone that with the COP26 meeting later this year, that we should all um, take the time to write to our political representatives, to make sure that they know our views about this. And polit politicians only take account of what a person thinks if that person tells them what they think, and that they need to know that we're tired of rhetoric and demand real action. So uh, it's a bit of a, a call there to action for all of us. Um, but thank you from on my behalf, David, and I'll hand back to, to Clive now to, to uh, give it the thanks. Thank you very much. Um, let me just get my video on. Um, David, that was absolutely fantastic. I have to confess, I'm a long time supporter of the RSPB, and I think it done terrific work. But what you've really reminded me is how much effort goes into maintaining a reserve for particular species. Um, you can't just let everything go. And, um, uh, and, and, and the uh, fact that you had a timetable going round of the year with pretty well every year busy doing something. So um, that's been an absolutely wonderful talk as far as I'm concerned with the, with the photographs and um, hearing about some uh, successes and some of these uh, uh, testing times, like with the turtle dove, and we do hope those come back, but, um, you know, what with um, uh, climate change and all these things, we, we, we just don't know. But um, it's been really good to know that um, Otmore is in such good hands, David, and to you and your colleagues and the volunteers, a big thank you. Uh, thank you to the audience. Um, thank you to my colleagues, Ian and uh, Tony, who've been um, very much actively in front of or behind the scenes to make sure that um, we, we stay on. And, um, and we wish you the very best, uh, David, for the, the coming season and for uh, the cranes and all these other things, uh, the curlews, and, and just hope those graphs go up. I really thought the graphs, the graphs were fascinating and the way in which you're looking at the ups and downs of the graphs and trying to work out why things were going wrong and then they were going right and then they were going wrong again. It must be a nerve wracking uh, time to be site manager, but I can see that you enjoy it. Thank you, David, very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good night. And uh, we hope to see you this time uh, in the autumn when we start our new series of talks. Uh, it will be in vision shortly and also the, uh, the walks um, all being well. Um, so thank you very much and I'll close down now.